All right. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining today. My name is Garth Spellman, and I am the Curator of Ornithology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And I am coming to you live from Denver, Colorado on this beautiful April Fool's Day. And I'm so glad you had a chance to join us because I am happy today to talk to you a little bit, a little bit about um, avian practical joker, jokers and tricksters. Um, sort of the tricks that birds might play on us and each other. Uh, some of them um, are very, very simple and very mundane jokes that we might think about day to day. Um, and others are things that can be pretty cruel when we consider what birds are doing to each other. So I'm happy to jump right in and I'll take questions from you at the end. So in many cultures, in myth, myth, mythology of those cultures, especially those of the Pacific Northwest, um, birds are considered to be very powerful creatures. And in many cases, they are considered tricksters um, and and animals that can disguise themselves in other forms. Uh, within the cultures of the American Pacific Northwest, the raven is a particularly powerful figure. Um, within the stories that are told about him, he stole light and lit up the world. He created the land, released people from a cockle shell and brought them fire. And it's his image on art pieces, on boats and on totems that tell the stories of his adventures. Um, in the creation story, when he brought light, he actually transforms himself into a hemlock needle and puts himself in a girl's um, water, water dish or bowl, and she drinks it up. And later on, she gives birth to a young boy, and that boy is, in fact, the raven. And as he grows up and gains the trust um, of the old man, her father, uh, he steals the light from their house and he, tr he transforms back into himself, into the raven and goes out into the world to bring light to the world. And it's another bird that actually steals a piece of this light that he stole. And that is an eagle. And that piece of light that the eagle steals becomes the moon and the light the raven brings becomes the sun. So... In mythology, these tricksters, these birds, are very powerful creatures and hold very important places in these cultures. But true birds, right, are not just tricksters in our, myth, in our mythology. In many ways, they can manipulate us humans and other mammals in many ways. And some are very simple ways that many of you might recognize and know, right? So for example, they love to build their nests on and in, unfortunately, our houses. So you can see the thrush up here in the left corner that's built their, their nest on the downspout. Um, we also have uh, swallows that build their nests right underneath the eaves of homes and raise their young. Woodpeckers that often will bore into our wood siding. Uh, these are rather unfortunate and house finches and house sparrows down here that if you have a hole in your eaves, they will get up in there and build nests that cause all sorts of problems and be, can be problematic for us homeowners. So they build these homes and in a way they're just using us, but it's not so fun. It might be a trick from them, but it's not so fun necessarily for us. And once these birds start building their nests, please be careful because they are all protected under the National Migratory Bird Treaty Act and you can't disturb the nest once it's started. So otherwise it's illegal. So please don't disturb those nests, wait for them to finish and raise their young and then find a way to patch up your house or get those nests out. Other ways that they manipulate us, they like to use a lot of the structures that we build um, to help them signal to other birds. Woodpeckers are very, very good at this, and especially northern flickers, if you live in North America, you'll see this all the time. They use the structures we build, metal structures, wood structures, to amplify their signals to other birds when they're looking for mates. Um, 
And you can hear that on this video if it goes. Oh. So they use the metal on a lot of these structures, whether it comes from the metal that you see here on this slide. And in my neighborhood here in Denver, they're constantly pounding on people's exhaust vents uh, during the breeding season to attract females because that metal sound amplifies their signals. And for them, it's a nice trick. For us, it can be really annoying if you're trying to get some sleep. They also consider us tools. And on April Fool's Day, I think that's important that we recognize that we are bird tools. So African honey guides in Africa, they use humans to, and they guide humans to honeybee hives so that they can feast on the mess that we live, leave behind. So yes, it does benefit the humans because they get the honey, but really they're doing it for themselves so they can feast on the mess because we're pretty messy. So carrion crows um, throughout Asia and in many places in Europe have learned to use us as nutcrackers. So they often carry uh, hard walnuts and other things to intersections and they'll use cars to drive over nuts to break them open for them because they can't crack them themselves and then they eat the nuts. Now many of you have probably seen documentaries that show oxpeckers. These are birds that you see on large mammals on the African savanna and you see them hitching a ride and you know to us it's it's nice to sort of picture them as sort of inert birds that are on these large mammals and using them just to pick insects off their hides or ticks out from, out from underneath their fur. But in many instances, the tricks they play are actually kind of a nuisance. You can see here, this red-billed oxpecker actually has opened up a wound on this giraffe. And they are in fact, some of the only blood drinkers that we find in the, in the bird world. And they'll keep wounds open on these large animals to you know, have a steady stream of nutrition coming in. So many times they're not necessarily eating those insects. They are keeping open wounds and gaping wounds on these animals and they can actually cause additional infections that harm those, those animals. So it's not necessarily a nice trick that they're playing. So, but I wanna point out that the tricks that birds play on us actually are pretty tame in other mammals. It's actually the tricks that they play on each other that can be downright cruel. And I'm gonna focus on one of the most cruel of the avian practical jokes that are out there, and that's brood parasitism. Brood parasites are birds that lay their eggs in the nests of other birds and they rely on those unsuspecting fools to raise their young. Now, there are some birds that only do this some of the time. And these are birds that we do something, it's called egg dumping. They will lay the egg in the nest of another female of the same species, um, just you know, to increase their chances at passing on their genes to the next generation. They're passing the buck and letting another female raise their young. Um, so golden eyes, this is an American golden eye female, and they do this. And actually extinct species also do this. These are passenger pigeons. And passenger pigeon females were known to egg dump uh, into the nests of other females as well. But the really sort of truly nasty practical jokers are the obligate brood parasites that we find uh, in the bird world. And they've evolved some fascinating strategies. Here you have pictured a common cuckoo. And common cuckoo hatchlings, they have remarkable growth rates. So a female will lay her eggs in the nest of a, for example, a reed warbler here. And the 
young cuckoo in the egg grows much faster than the eggs of that reed warbler. And then the young grow even faster. And they also exhibit something and have evolved something called egg tossing behavior that you can see this young common cuckoo. So a hatchling that is only a couple of days old um, when it can't see, it's blind, has no feathers. It has the instinct to push the reed warbler's eggs out of the nest. It's a terrible joke. And then the reed warbler will raise that common cuckoo young as if it was its own till it's able to fledge. Another example of some incredible adaptive strategies that have evolved with this practical joking in the bird world um, is found in indigo birds. Indigo birds are these bluish black birds that you see here on the right, and they parasitize African fire finches that are here on the left. And they specialize, indigo birds specialize on a single species of fire finch, and they have evolved mouth markings that are identical to those of the host so that the fire finch females and males can't actually tell the difference between their own young and the young of the indigo birds. It is pretty remarkable. So in our part of the world, in North America, brown-headed cowbirds are actually some of the most common brood parasites. And they lay their eggs in the nests of over 200 species of birds. And the females can lay up to 36 eggs in a single season. And they are actually a threat to the survival of several threatened and endangered species like for example, this Kirtland's warbler. So that faces two threats of habitat loss and cowbird parasitism um, within its habitat. So on this April Fools, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of these avian practical jokers. And I just want you to be thankful on this day that if you're playing a trick on your parents or your boss or your coworkers, or they're doing the same to you, just be thankful you're not on the receiving end of an avian prank. And with that, I would be more than happy to take any questions that are out there. Awesome presentation, Garth. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Memory. I work in the marketing department here at the museum and I'm just popping in like I always do to read your questions to Garth. All right, I did um, see a few on Facebook, a few people asking about other um, species of birds. Are they tricksters? So we have our blue jays tricksters and our owls tricksters. Are there any um, tricks that they play on other birds or on humans? Well, I'm not so sure about owls. I mean, blue jays are known to pester other species, um, and they also are known to eat eggs um, from young songbirds' nests. So they're just out there foraging. Um, there's another example of, of a good trick that a, a bird does play, and there are certain species of heron uh, and egret that are actually really good at using um, reflective objects and leaves as fishing implements. And so okay. they will put them on the surface of the water and they, and the reflection will attract fish um, to that on the surface of the water and they'll use it to get the fish attracted and then they'll strike and catch the fish. Interesting, so. interesting. And I am not seeing any more questions right now. Oh, here we go. I just got one on YouTube from Denica who asks, I've heard owl nests contain dozens of pet collars. Is that an urban myth? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I have not personally seen that. Um, and I think that it could be an urban myth. However, <laughs> I do have a friend when I was a graduate student in Alaska um, who had her small Jack Russell Terrier that was picked up by a great gray owl. So I, I mean, I do have direct witnesses to this type of behavior. Whether or not those collars end up back in the nest, I can't attest to. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, mm-hmm. those I've had a sm- small dogs before, and that has always been my concern. Like, don't, please don't get swiped up by a hawk. You know, please don't get <laughs> stolen. That's a really good question. Thanks, Danica. Um, just going to take another quick stroll and make sure I'm not missing any more questions. Oh, here we go. We have another one from Mina who asked, well, what about geese? Um, do geese play tricks? And I'm not a scientist, but I would like to say that they do. I think, you know, I've seen some really horrible goose accidents in my life. So I think they're tricksters, but what do you think, Garth? You're the pro. I think, I think geese can in a way inadvertently play tricks on us because in many cases, they know that we will stop for them in traffic. Mm -hmm. If you've ever noticed a goose crossing the road, Yep. They slow down. They, they take their time. They do. And, right. and they know that they're in charge at that moment. And they're just looking at you like, yeah, you hold your horses. <laughs> mm-hmm. I will take yep. my own sweet time crossing the road. That's true. I mean, I've definitely noticed that here, especially here. The geese here, they they take their time and we let them. We said we let yes. them. Oh. And I do notice that I get a lot more emails at the museum uh, during the middle of the summer about urban geese and urban geese getting really aggressive mm-hmm. that time mm-hmm. of year. And that's, that actually has to do with their natural history. So geese, when they're molting, when they're changing out their flight feathers, they drop them all at the same time. So they're actually unable to fly during those periods of time. So if you get close to them, yeah, they naturally get more aggressive because their ability to escape, right? Yeah. Is not as great because they're unable to fly at that time. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's mm-hmm. something to consider. I would say most of the geese attacks I've seen have been, yeah, in the summer and the spring. So that, that is something to keep in mind. In the um, spring, it's because they have their young. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 I mean, I feel differently now. I, I don't blame he says much now. You've softened my heart now. <laughs> Well, great. Well, I am not seeing any more questions, but that's okay. If you um, think of some more, just drop them here and we can um, always come back and send them to Garth and get you an answer. Um, But how about this, Garth? How about you leave us with um, one really cool uh, bird fact um, from your presentation that we can take with us into our weekends to make us look like we are just super cool, um, super knowledgeable about birds? I think... One really cool thing that they that people can take home about indigo birds, which are those cool birds that mimic the same mouth markings, yeah, um, is that they also they learn the song of their host and incorporate that. That's why they specialize on a single species, is because the indigo birds will in turn sing a song that sounds like their host. Mm-hmm. Wow, I mean a lot to go through to, yes, you know, mm-hmm. something that you're not. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Gar. Thank you for being here. Thank you everybody for watching. And like always, we'll be back next Thursday with another episode of Science Division Live. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Memory. Thanks. <laughs>